I have a confession to make. I am a Sonic fan. No matter how bad his track record might be, I'm always going to be excited for the next game. Even the less well-received titles have their own charm to them, and some fall comfortably into the so bad it's good category. It's by far my favorite series that stars a blue hedgehog. Playing a Sonic game is like smoking a cigarette. I know it's bad for me, but I just can't help it. Yes, it can be disheartening to see Sonic come out with miss, after miss, after miss, but I'm always willing to give him a chance in the next title, because I know that one day, one day, Sonic Team will get it right. It seems that day has finally come with the release of Sonic Frontiers. An open world Sonic game sounds good on paper, but so do a lot of other Sonic games, and those don't hit the mark nearly as well. What makes Sonic Frontiers an enjoyable experience isn't the world design, although it's pretty good, isn't the story, although it's pretty good, and isn't the boss fights, although they're pretty good. No, what makes Sonic Frontiers an actually good Sonic game comes down to one thing, the controls. The trade-off between speed and controllability has been a constant balancing act throughout Sonic's catalog. So to explain what makes the controls work in Sonic Frontiers, let me take you on a little history lesson, way back to the very first 3D Sonic that anyone cared about, Sonic Adventure. The late 90s was a time of technological puberty for a lot of series, moving from 2D to 3D. The results of this for Sonic are a mixed bag. Sonic controls basically like other 3D platformers from this era did, just a bit faster. But since speed is the name of the game here, Sonic's first major 3D outing has to show that off and demonstrate why he's still relevant in a new era of gaming. So in order to crank up the dial, the game has a heavy reliance on on-rails set pieces through the use of boost pads and locked movement. It looks cool in a trailer or commercial, but when you play, you're not really doing anything but holding the analog stick up. It's more like riding a roller coaster than driving a car. In the balance between controllability and speed, speed gets all the focus here. This game also introduced the homing attack, which closely follows the automated style of gameplay that the design team was pursuing. The most you can say in its favor is that it works in a game like this, but there's nothing particularly challenging or interesting about it. Sonic Adventure 2 was more of the same in this regard. Flashy visuals with minimal player input. While it's nothing extraordinary, it's serviceable, which is usually all you can ask for in a Sonic game. The same can't be said for Sonic Heroes, the next entry in the franchise. Even as a Sonic fan, I'd rank this game lower than pretty much every other title in the series, and that's entirely due to the controls. They are incredibly slippery. It feels like you're trying to balance a ping pong ball that's covered in Vaseline on a sheet of ice. I think there's a lot of misplaced nostalgia for Sonic Heroes because of the fun visuals and music for the first few levels, but when you get to the later stages, all the issues with the controls rear their ugly heads. Trying to actually beat the game is extremely frustrating. If for some reason you have the desire to play this game, play the first stage, Seaside Hill, then put it down. It does not get any better after that. Next up is the 2006 title Sonic the Hedgehog, commonly referred to as Sonic 06, and even more commonly referred to as the worst Sonic game ever, although I think Heroes is much more deserving of that title. It was intended as a reboot of the Sonic franchise, although it has much more in common with the games that preceded it than those that followed it. The controls here are similar to Adventure 1 and 2, but with a key difference. In the adventure games, Sonic moves pretty fast, but only after some build-up. The first second or two you're pushing the stick, he's moving a little bit slower. In Sonic 06, he hits his max speed right out of the gate. It feels like the second you nudge the analog stick just a bit, Sonic's already a mile away. This makes him much harder to control overall, and precision movement is difficult. Couple that with the numerous glitches and bizarre level geometry, and navigating Sonic to the end of each stage feels more like you're working against the controls than with them. Still better than Heroes, but very rough around the edges. Following Sonic 06 was Sonic Unleashed, which was much more of a reboot to the franchise than the intended reboot was. Here, Sonic's controls are entirely redone, with him controlling more like a car instead of a character. Looking back at this reinvention of Sonic, it makes a lot of sense. 
With such an emphasis on going fast, it's logical to take inspiration from a genre of games that are already built around speed, and it does take a number of mechanics from racing games, like drifting and boosting. Sonic Unleashed also introduced 2D sections to the mix, which turns the dial away from speed and towards controllability. It's a nice bone to throw fans of the classic Sonic games, when all they had before this were the handheld titles. But aside from these sections, compared to the previous titles like the Adventure series, it's more on rails than ever. Yes, it looks fun and fast, but playing it you're still just holding the analog stick up, while occasionally doing a homing attack or sidestepping. It's clear that after this, Sonic Team moved ahead with the if it ain't broke, don't fix it mentality, keeping the same formula for Sonic Colors, Sonic Generations, and Sonic Forces. And so finally in 2022, we got a fresh dose of the blue blur with Sonic Frontiers. Even though things were cruising along well enough with the Unleashed style of gameplay, it was long past time for a changeup. It's by far the most ambitious Sonic title, with the majority of the game taking place in a number of open world areas. The zones are massive, requiring quite a bit of speed to get around efficiently. But there's also some precision platforming, where the player needs to make quick decisions in order to maintain the momentum. More than ever, Sonic needs that delicate balance of controllability and speed. So does Sonic Frontiers nail the controls? For the most part, yes. And it does this by giving the player options. When you push the analog stick, Sonic starts off a bit slower like in the adventure games, and gradually builds up to a nice speed that feels fast, but controllable. From there, you can hold the right trigger to boost, giving you an insane burst of speed. You can also upgrade your speed over the course of the game, or upgrade your rings if you can't handle the intensity. You can also tweak your controls in the settings, which is super helpful for balancing the game for both new and experienced players. It's the versatility behind the controls in Sonic Frontiers that makes them work. You have to be able to blast from one spot to the next, but also be able to turn on a dime. Separating the boosted speed from the normal speed is the biggest advantage here. If you need to take things a bit more slow and precise you can, or you can blaze through like you're trying to buy the last PS5 at GameStop. The most impressive thing about the controls is how they work with the game's multiple settings. Not only are there the open zones where you spend the majority of your time, but there's also linear stages that take inspiration from the Unleashed era titles, and 2D sections that can be found throughout both areas. Sonic Team was ambitious to pursue a control scheme that would satisfy three different playstyles, given that they've arguably never nailed an individual one in a previous game. But not only did they do what seemed to be impossible with Sonic Frontiers, they did it in a way that brings elements from all the previous titles together. It has the homing attack, on rail sections, and the bounce attack from the adventure games, and the boosting, sidestepping, and mid-air dancing, I guess you'd call it, from the Unleashed era games. And it even has the power boost from the Sonic movies. Plus, I'd like to think that the open world areas take a bit of inspiration from those in Sonic 06. I mean, come on, you can't tell me that these don't look similar. The only move missing here is the spin dash, which is Sonic's most iconic. I get that it might be irrelevant with the boost being present, but a Sonic game without the spin dash is like a burger without the patty. You can't forget the foundation. But as a longtime Sonic fan, it's great to finally have a game that I don't feel embarrassed to enjoy playing. Over the last few decades, at their best, Sonic games have been good, with a giant asterisk pointing to a bunch of flaws and strange design choices that are tough to ignore. Sonic Frontiers might not be perfect, but it's the best and most fully realized 3D Sonic game that's ever been released. It might have taken a while to get there, but it feels like Sonic has finally arrived and can justify his inclusion in the modern gaming landscape. It's a fresh start for the franchise and hopefully can be the new baseline for Sonic games going forward.